I'm Jay Allen. I'm the director of My True North, the UK's leading ethical coaching company. I'm a keynote speaker. I'm an author of Battlefield to Boardroom and most recently The Roads to Utopia. And I'm the founder of the Add a Zero Business Challenge. Now, you might be wondering, what's the Add a Zero Business Challenge? And for that, I just want to quickly, briefly talk to you about something that happened in 2015. You're probably one of the people, like I, that was challenged in 2015 to the Ice Bucket Challenge. Do you remember the one where the ALS got us involved to be able to pour an ice bucket over our heads to raise a few pounds for the ALS, char ALS charity and then to nominate somebody else to do so? Well, that fascinated me. I did get involved. My Ice Bucket Challenge is firmly embedded on YouTube somewhere as I challenged three other peoples to take part. But as a business owner, it really starts to make me think because what I saw was a video go viral. You see, rather than it being an instructional thing or a charity that simply says, can you give us three pound a month? They challenged us to do something for ourselves, something that was different. They got us to do something that was completely absurd, that put us into a different mindset, and then to challenge somebody else to do so. And what I saw over the next 10 months was over 500 million videos loaded onto YouTube with this hashtag ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. And that got me thinking. Now, the following year, 2016, I'm not sure whether you did take part in the 22 day, 22 push up challenge, raising awareness for American service leavers and the 22 people a day in America that commit suicide with post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, as you know, it's something that's extremely dear to my heart and therefore I happily took part every day for 22 days. But that got me thinking even further. You see, if you do something for more than 21 days on the trot, it tends to start to create a habit. And by doing 22 days, I actually did 63 days before I missed a day. But the other clever thing was, rather than doing an ice bucket challenge and challenging three people on one day, the 22 day push up challenge was you challenged one person a day for 22 days. And rather than 500 million videos being uploaded onto YouTube, over 900 million videos were launched with the 22 day, 22 push up challenge. At the same time of that in my business, I'd spent a lot of time looking at why businesses fail. Now, don't get me wrong, most people talk about the success stories in business, but I was more intrigued about why do some businesses simply stop existing? What happens? What, what, what goes wrong to an existing business that was doing okay for itself and then suddenly plummets and fails? And over about a three year period, we've looked and case studied 258 different businesses that were doing all right for themselves, but then, but then failed. Because I wanted to know why because if you can find out why, you can fix it. You can make sure that whatever they did doesn't happen to you. So we created this thing called the Add a Zero Challenge and it was all based around looking at the eight things within business that 258 businesses had failed on and then said, how do we put it right? And in essence, it's because too many people concentrate for too long on one aspect of business without looking at the impact that has on the other parts of the business. Let me give you an example. You cannot increase your sales and sales and sales without good marketing to get more people on board to understand what it is you sell. But there's no point doing lots and lots and lots of marketing if you're selling a poor product. There's no point trying to sell lots of product if you haven't got the infrastructure in business to be able to support all of those new demands for your product or service. We've got to understand the impact that any one thing that we do has on the rest of business. Well, I guess it started from two parents, um, one with whom was an employee 
and the other who'd started his own business and become an employer. And what I'd noticed between the two is that whilst the employee had security in the safety net of a ongoing salary, the employer got to make decisions and choices about what and where and when and why. And it was that that first inspired me to say that I really want to, at some stage, own my own business. And, and in those days, I, I didn't really know what it was going to be, but I certainly looked at my two parents and decided that I would sooner be an employer than an employee. However, I, I did university, I went through and got a degree. Um, I, I did well in my degree and I was offered a job off the back of it. Um, and almost by default, ended up as an employee. Um, but I did it for seven months and hated it. Um, I, I despised what I was doing or who I was doing it for or why I was doing it. Um, I was just another peg in a, in, in, a, in a hole really and not really having my own identity at all. So I left. Um, I gave up, I, I decided that that was it. Um, but ironically, rather than leaving to be able to start my own business, I was probably still too young then to be able to try and do it. And I left for adventure because all my friends that hadn't gone to university had joined the British Army. They'd seen that advert on the Sun newspaper, the army needs you, during the Falklands War. Um, and whilst I was studying at university, they were training to go to the Falklands. So when I joined the army, the Falklands was well over. Um, but I joined the army you know, in order to be able to get this alpha male bit out, my, uh, out of my out of my psyche as it were, in order to be able to go back and do whatever it was next. But I fell in love with the army, I fell in love with the adventure, I fell in love with the, the difference every day and not knowing what was tomorrow and chose to make it a career. So I did that for 14 years. Um, I travelled all the way around the world, um, I rose through the ranks, um, I did well for myself, I, I made it a, a good career choice. Um, however, I was medically discharged after an accident 14 years into my service um, and very quickly throughout my medical process, throughout the, um, the, the, the leaving the armed forces, I realised that I was going to be left with that choice again as to what I was going to do next. Is it going to be an employee or am I going to become an employer? And a year after I left, I cheated. Um, I, I had a significant payout from the army and I invested it well. Um, I did well for a year working um, at, at a corporate level um, in Civvy Street, or in Civvy Street as we used to call it in those days. Um, and I had a pot of money that I didn't really know what to do with. So I cheated and I bought an existing business, a business that had been trading for 14 years, that had already got three members of staff, that had got um, an order book already coming into it. But, we, but it was for sale because the founder of the business had just been recently diagnosed with a terminal illness and was looking to be able to exit quickly and I'd got sufficient funds to be able to, I couldn't buy it outright, it was a quite a significant purchase, but I did have enough money that if I put everything into the business that the bank was willing to see that I was serious enough that they would lend me the rest of the money to buy this business. So I bought a business on the 26th of October uh, 2005. Um, haven't really got a clue as to what I was buying, I just knew that I didn't want to become an employee. Um, and yet, I applied everything that I'd learned from the military, I applied everything I'd learned from working in corporate life, and four years later I was selling that business with 22 staff and a significantly larger payroll than it was when I first bought it. There was a national charity to which I've got a real, real close, um, close a passion and, and affection for, that was doing a UK tour trying to raise awareness and funds um, for, for its coffers um, and they were coming to my local hometown and I thought, do you know what, I'm going to go along, I'm going to go and support this local charity, I'm going to take a whole bunch of friends and colleagues with me, I'm going to make a sizable donation, or at least I thought a, a significant donation to the charity um, and I noticed that an ex-colleague of mine was actually working for the charity and was responsible for delivering this, this, uh, this message um, at this particular venue and I thought it would be lovely to catch up with him, find out how he's getting on and to be able to make a donation and, and see him on his way. And what happened earlier on that evening is the colleague that was driving up to the venue was unfortunately involved in a car accident. Now I must say he wasn't badly injured in any way 
but he was certainly in no fit states to be able to stand in front of about 150, 160 people and deliver a passionate keynote about the, the, the charity and all it, all it was trying to raise. And the event organiser was pulling his hair out, frantically worrying about what he was going to do with 150 people that had all already come to listen to somebody if nobody was there to be listened to. He said his wife was on the internet busy trying to download stuff to try and inspire something of the evening and, and prevent it from being a flop. And I simply said to him, well, well, I know him. I used to serve with him. I know the charity is something I'm really passionate about. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. Now, I, I must admit, the intent was, if you want me to write down a few things that I know, to pass to your wife, to be able to make something of the evening while I sit and have a giggle with my friends and colleagues, then, then that was the intent. But he never came to me, so I assumed it must have been okay. But we'd had starter and we'd had main course and he finally got up with the microphone and said, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this evening is to be able to raise funds for the local charity, or the national charity. Unfortunately, our keynote speaker isn't able to be with us today, but we've gone one better and got a colleague. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Allen. And I suddenly realised it was me. Um, so I got up rather nervously and I shared a 15, 20 minute story about my understanding of the charity and how it had funded my recovery when I was first medically discharged from the army. I talked about my, my good friend and colleague and the memories I had of him and our service life together. And I sat down rather nervously with a a stiff drink, hoping that I'd done a good job. At the end of the evening, three people came to visit me. One of them said, well done, son. I've never heard a speech delivered so emotionally and so passionately. Whatever it is that you do, stop doing it. You ought to be a motivational speaker. And that got me thinking. Another guy came up to me and he said, I've never been so touched by somebody speaking on stage. He says, I go to do all of these things all of the time. Um, how much are you hoping to raise? Well, I'd worked out from the website that when it said £77 pays for one hour's treatment and £89 pays for a day case, I'd worked out that the amount of time I'd spent with that charity, I owed them £86,400. So I said to him, well, I'm hoping to try and help raise £86,400, expecting him to say, best of luck son, here's a tenner. But he didn't. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a private bank checkbook and wrote a check for £86,400 and said, there you go son, now you're free. Now that got me thinking again, because if I could do that on the first time I'd ever delivered a speech and somebody else said that I was a good motivational speaker, then perhaps I owed it to the charity to see what else I could do. And the third person came up to me and said, I'm the agent for a speaker booking agency, a bureau in London that we'd comes to listen to your colleague and unfortunately has not been able to make it. If you're not already exclusive with whichever agency sent you, can we book you? How much do you charge? And I was fascinated. I'd, I'd never heard of a speaker bureau before or a, an agent or a booker. How much do I charge? I'd paid 500 pounds to pay for the table of 10 to be there that evening. Exclusive. I, I didn't know what the word meant. So we agreed to meet about three days later. And five weeks later, I was delivering my first paid speech through the bureau at Durham University. And over the next five years, it's taken me to 47 countries and speaking to over half a million business owners, sharing an inspirational story, either about mental health in the workplace or about sharing about how to think differently in order to be able to achieve more. I think other than the fact that I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, I was sectioned under the Mental Health Act for my own protection. And when I first left the army with this section, with this mental health scar, no one took me seriously. I applied for 153 jobs in Civvy Street and had 153 interviews because on paper my CV looks relatively good. 
I had 153 interviews and talked to people as I'm talking to you now. And yet the moment I admitted that I had a mental health issue, on four occasions, I was escorted out the, out the building before I'd even finished the interview. On one occasion, the HR manager said, we have a duty of care to protect our own staff. I knew that the only way to earn a living was to be able to do it myself. So the first challenge is stop being judged by somebody else's criteria. Make sure that you know who you are and make sure that everyone else knows who you are also. Be proud of who you are. Be willing to be able to, to stand up for whatever it is that you believe in. When it comes to challenges, I think we face them every day. I certainly wake up in the morning and decide as to how am I going to react to whatever today throws at me. And it reminds me of an excerpt from a gentleman called Viktor Frankl, who was a survivor from Auschwitz in the Second World War. Now, Viktor Frankl is sadly no longer with us, but his diary and his memoirs are. And on one particular day, he wrote in his memoirs, you can strip me of all my clothes. You can strip me of food and water and every human decency, but you can never strip me of my attitude. I get to choose. So every day I choose. I choose how I'm going to react to whatever life throws at me. And I think it's massively important for anybody in life, be it in business or not, to be able to have absolute clarity on who you are and the challenges that you face, because we all face them, and what you're going to do about it depends on your attitude to it. It was Confucius that said, the man who said I can and the man who said I can't will undoubtedly both be right. For the man that said I can will find a way. And the man that said I can't has already found an excuse.